Church, hear the gospel this morning proclaimed. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Ryan, for reading that incredible passage for us. You know, some people have an ability to see things that it seems like other people can't. Some people see a pile of wood, a bunch of random ingredients in the pantry, an empty lot, and they just see it for what it is. But there's other people who seem to have the ability to see the potential. I was thinking about this just in the last couple of weeks as I was studying our passage for this morning. One evening, I was walking out, walking out of the office, Uh, with Joshua Blakely. Josh is our primary audio technician. He's actually back in the booth right now, making sure everything sounds good and looks good this morning. Josh and I were walking out. I said, what are you gonna do this evening? And he said, I'm gonna go down to the lumber yard and pick out a piece of wood for a project. I said, oh, what's the project? And Josh said, I'll know when I see the wood. (laughs) He had the ability to look at a piece of wood and see a finished product. I think chefs cooks, they do the same thing. I don't watch a ton of cooking shows, but everyone I've ever seen seems to be based on the premise that these people can take a bunch of random ingredients and make something incredible out of it. They can see the potential in those ingredients. Or consider the architect who who looks at a lot, who looks at a piece of land, and they can envision a building that will work in that space and complement that space. They can see the potential where others can't. And as I studied the passage this morning, it seems to me that that God looked at us and he saw our potential. So here's what we're gonna see as we work our way through Ephesians chapter two. The first three verses are gonna describe our problem. And we're gonna see that it's a problem that we ourselves can't solve. That's why I've labeled verses four through nine as God's solution. It's not our solution. We couldn't come up with a solution, and even if we did, we wouldn't have the ability to enact it, but God provides a solution, and then in verse 10, as you just heard, as Ryan read, we're gonna see what our response is to God's solution to our problem. So let's turn there together. We're gonna be in Ephesians chapter two. If you've got your Bible, your digital device, maybe you brought your Ephesians study guide. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter two. My name's Michael. I serve on the community team here at Fellowship Fayetteville. And if you're joining us for the first time or the first time in a while, maybe, you're catching us at the beginning of our study of the book of Ephesians, a study that's gonna take us all the way to Thanksgiving. This is our third week as we turn to chapter two in this incredible letter that Paul, the apostle Paul, the great missionary apostle to the Gentiles wrote, he wrote this letter to the churches in and around Ephesus in the first century AD. And before we get into the text, I wanna let you know why our slides are gonna look a little different this morning. If you have worshiped with us before, you're kinda used to how we present the scripture on the screen. 
And this morning, they're going to look a little different. If you're using your Ephesians study guide, and I hope that you are, you've seen that each week, it walks us through studying that week's passage. It encourages us to underline certain things, circle certain things, ask ourselves certain questions as we read and reread the passage. And so what I did was I took my Ephesians study guide and I sent it to Hallie May, our, our media team leader who makes our slides each week. And I said, I want you to turn this into something usable for our teaching. And because she's a magician, she's done that for us. And so I wanna encourage you, take your study guide. This is what it's designed for. Maybe you like to mark it up in your Bible. Maybe you like to just print it off on a single sheet of paper. Take the text, work the guide, underline, circle, highlight, make notes in your margins. I left those off of this because my handwriting's so bad I was embarrassed for you to see it. But you can learn to study the Bible for yourself, or if you already know how to do that, you can get better at it by engaging with us. The Ephesians study guides are still available if you need one. And so with all that said, let's jump into Ephesians chapter two, beginning in verse one. Paul writes, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you once used, to, I'm sorry, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You'll remember that Paul spent chapter one painting this grand picture of what we call the cosmic Christ, the Christ who's over everything, the Christ who provides every spiritual blessing for us in the heavenly places. He actually ends verse one writing about Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And then he begins chapter two, as for you, man, talk about getting in your face. Enough about Jesus. Let's talk about you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. Okay, don't sugarcoat it, Paul. <laughs> Give it to us straight. He goes right at it, doesn't he? As for you, Ephesian believers, you were dead. Now, the Greek word there is nekros, which means dead. There, there's just no way around it. It means dead. Now, we know these Ephesian believers, they weren't dead. They were going to work and raising their kids, and their hearts were beating. So what's Paul getting at here? Well, he doesn't mean physically dead. He means spiritually dead. And the clear teaching of the Bible is that all of us are born spiritually dead. That means we're separated from God and unable to do anything spiritual. We can have physically healthy bodies, and sharp minds, but in our spirit, in the innermost part of ourselves, we're dead in our transgressions and sins. That means, just as we said in our corporate confession earlier, that we haven't done things we should have done, and we have done things we shouldn't have. And because of those sins, those transgressions, those trespasses, we're separated from God, and we're unable to respond to him in any meaningful way because we're spiritually dead, and Paul wants us to see this applies to all of humanity, and he's going to show us that we're in this situation because of three reasons. The first is that we all, he says, we all followed the ways of this world, now, when the New Testament writers refer to the world, they're talking about the dominant systems on planet Earth, the cultures that shape society. And for thousands of years, those systems and those cultures have been anti-God. The way the world works pushes people away from God and from his will. And he tells us why here. It's the second reason. They're all motivated by the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Now, he's going to use other names for this ruler. In chapter 4, verse 27, and again in chapter 6, verse 11, he's going to call him the devil. In 6.15, he calls him the evil one. 
And what he's saying is there is a personal spiritual being who motivates the world to be anti-God. That's what Paul calls here the ways of the world. It's all these systems that are provoked by the devil. You know, for years, I met with Gary Harrell. Many of you know Gary. He was one of the earliest pastors here at our church, and I was fortunate to be personally discipled by Gary, and he would always remind me, because of this, because of the world systems and the devil, the Christian life is like rowing a canoe upstream. You have to keep rowing because the world and the devil are trying to push you the other way. And as soon as you take your paddle out of the water, you're not standing static. You don't maintain your position. You start going backwards. So Paul says, Ephesian Christians, this used to be you. And it's still the case for those who are disobedient. Literally, it's the sons of disobedience. In other words, people are still in this situation who've not yet turned to Christ to be rescued from the state of affairs. And then, just in case, his readers or you or me might think, well, that's about them, right? We're the church people. He's talking about the bad people. He takes it up a notch in verse three. He says, all of us, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And just like that, he gives us the third of the three forces working against us. We've got the world and its systems. We've got the devil. And then he tells us we've got our flesh. All of us at times have given in to what our flesh, our bodies, our sinful nature desired. The thing we'd been thinking about that we knew we shouldn't engage in. We give in and we do it. And so just like them, Paul says, we all deserve wrath. Now, I don't know about you, but wrath is not a word I use very often. And whenever I see a theological word like this, I always go to my man for concise definitions, Dr. Wayne Grudem. Here's what he says. God's wrath means that he hates all sin. Makes sense, right? God hates sin. Sin, here's, here's the fuller quote that follows the definition. Dr. Grudem says, if God loves all that is right and good and all that conforms to his moral character, then it shouldn't be surprising that he would hate everything that's opposed to his moral character. God's wrath directed against sin is therefore closely related to his holiness and justice. Now, before you say with your mouth or just in your mind, okay, Michael, let's, let's get off the wrath thing. It's not what we talk about around here. Some of you are thinking, hey, man, God's wrath's kind of been out of style around churches for a while. Stick with me for a second. I want you to think about this. What if God didn't hate sin? What if God wasn't outraged by wrongdoing, then what kind of God would we have? When you think about the kind of sins that make you angry, that turn your stomach, when you think about innocent people being harmed, when you think about hatred and racism, genocide, oppression, those things make us angry. So how angry do you think they made the God who created and loves the person being hated, abused, oppressed? We actually want God to be angry at sin because we want a God who's just. But because he is a just God, that means he has to take our sin just as seriously. My sin and your sin. And unless we take a moment to understand what this text is teaching, we can't appreciate what comes next. If we only focus on God's mercy and God's grace without understanding the seriousness 
of our own sin. Unless we understand that sin has separated us from God. It's placed us rightly under his wrath. Then we can't understand what comes next. Now, I know at this point, some of you are thinking, okay, get to the good stuff. All right, I'm going to, but I have one more thing to say about this first. It's really easy to look at this passage and think it's about someone else. But who's it written to? It's written to the church. It's written to believers. And so if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to just think about this passage for a minute because it's really easy for all of us to catch ourselves thinking of people who don't know the Lord as the enemy. People out there who are saying and doing things that are anti-God. It's really easy in our flesh to get angry at those people. But when I read this, it reminds me, I should look at those people And instead of getting mad, my heart should break for them. I should look at them and say in my mind and in my heart, outside of Christ, that's me. If God hadn't redeemed me as just an act of sheer grace and mercy, I would be saying and doing those exact same things. Paul wants us, the church, to remember we're not inherently good. We don't deserve to be commended. We deserve wrath. But fortunately for us, God doesn't give us what we deserve. Look at verse four. It begins with the word, but. Circle it. It's such an important word. It indicates a total change of thought, a reversal. But. Because of his great love for us, it's literally because of the great Love with which he loved us. Because of the agape with which he agaped us. God, who's rich in mercy. What's mercy? Mercy is not getting something bad that you deserve. Which in this case is wrath. God being rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Man, this magnifies the importance of the resurrection, doesn't it? When we think about that Easter morning after Jesus went to the cross and paid for our sins by giving up his life, on the third day he was resurrected to life. But this tells us it wasn't just Jesus that was resurrected. It was all of us who have placed our faith in him. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you were made alive with Christ. And you see in my notes, I've highlighted Christ Sometimes I put a little cross next to it. It draws my attention to the centrality of Christ. He's the key to this whole passage because it's our union with him that makes our salvation possible. And I want you to look at when this happened. While we were dead in our transgressions. God didn't wait for us to get our act together. God didn't say, hey, clean yourself up a little bit. Break a couple of bad habits, come back to me and we'll talk. We were dead. We were unable to do any of those things. We couldn't reach for him. And Paul tells us in another letter, Romans, that we wouldn't reach for him. We didn't have the ability to desire him because we were dead. Even While we were dead in our transgressions, he saved us. It's by grace you've been saved. You see the three words I've circled, but grace saved. Grace, it's unmerited favor. It's getting something good that you don't deserve and that you could never pay back. You might say mercy is not getting something bad you deserve, and grace is getting something good that you don't deserve, and it's God's Grace that saves us. It's incredible news. It's the heart of the gospel message. Jesus died so we can live. Even better, Jesus was raised to eternal life so we can live eternally. And it's all grace. We don't deserve it. We could never earn it. And that's not the end of it. Because verse six begins with the word and. 
And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God did all of that, all of that for us. The commentator John Stott says, we were made alive with Christ, that's the resurrection, we were raised with Christ, that's the ascension, and now we're seated with him, that's called his session. Paul is saying, it's not just that we admire Jesus, it's not just that we know about Jesus, we are so closely united with him that we were resurrected to life with him. We ascended to heaven with him and now we're with him as he's seated in the very throne room of heaven at the right hand of the Father. What this passage is saying is that all of this affects our life now. It's not strictly something that's waiting for us in the future. If you're a follower of Jesus, you were dead in your sin and now not only are you alive, you're alive forever. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can walk with Jesus as he is your advocate in the throne room of heaven. We've gone from the lowest of depths to the highest of heights. And why did God do all that? In order that, underline that, in order that, we call that a henna clause, the word henna in the Greek. It means he's about to explain something. In order that, in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. God did all this so that we, the church, would showcase God's grace in this age, which we call the church age, in the next age, which we call the millennial kingdom, when Jesus will reign and rule on the earth, and in the age after that, which we call eternity future, when there's a new heaven and a new earth. God is showing through the church that his grace, the riches of his grace, have been revealed in Christ Jesus. And we're gonna see in two weeks, when we press into chapter three, that he's demonstrating this against these spiritual forces. That these dark spiritual forces are gonna see that God has been vindicated. His grace reigns supreme. He's vindicated by winning the victory for us through Christ. And with all of that, all of that is a backdrop. We're gonna look at verse eight. If you're new to Christianity or if you're just here checking this out, I want you to experience this fresh. But if you've been following Jesus for a while and this is a really familiar verse to you, I want you to try to look at it with new eyes based on everything we've said to set it up. Verse eight, for it is by grace that you've been saved. Through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. That's the essence of salvation. By grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ. All right, come back to me if you've drifted off. If you only get one thing today, I want you to get this. Everybody with me? You can't earn your salvation. You can't work your way to heaven. No amount of good behavior, no amount of good works, no amount of moral living will get you to heaven. It's only through grace, by faith, in Jesus Christ. Y'all, we just finished 21 weeks in the book of John. What was the theme of John? Believe, believe, believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by placing your faith in him, you can have eternal life. Now along comes Paul, and what's Paul saying? It's through faith, believe. Believe that you're a sinner dead in your transgressions. But God sent his son, Jesus, the Messiah, who died on the cross in your place and was resurrected to eternal life and now offers it to you. Believe that you stand in need of a savior because we can't save ourselves. We all need the grace that God offers us in Jesus. We can't earn it. And none of us deserves it. Because if we did it wouldn't be grace. So, Paul says, it's nothing for you to brag about, to feel superior about. Are those of us who have experienced salvation by grace in Christ better than the people out there who haven't? No. 
we're just forgiven by a sheer act of grace we didn't merit or deserve. While we were still spiritually dead, God did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And so we don't have anything to brag about. All we can do is point to God to talk about his kindness and his mercy and his grace. We can thank him, we can glorify him, and we can invite other people to experience what we've already experienced in Christ Jesus. And so our problem, sin that placed us under God's wrath. God's solution, salvation in Christ given as a gift of grace, received by faith, and now our response, it's in verse 10. For we're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're God's handiwork. Some translations say workmanship. The Greek word there is poema. It's the word we get our word poem from, and it means a work of art. And a work of art should always give glory to the artist. If you ever go to Crystal Bridges and you look at an incredible painting, you don't ask Man, who is that in that painting? You ask, who painted that? The glory goes to the one who did the creating. We're God's poem, his work of art, his creation, his handiwork, created for a purpose. And the purpose is to do good works, which he's already prepared for us. While we were still dead in our sins, God had prepared things for us to do once he had made us alive in Christ. You notice I've boxed the word works. I did the same thing in verse nine. I think Paul's using the exact same word in the Greek in both places because he's saying those works don't save you, but they are an appropriate response to what God has already done for us. Tim Keller in his book, Reason for God, famously said this. Religion operates on the, the principle, I obey, therefore I'm accepted by God. But the operating principle of the gospel is, I'm accepted by God through what Christ has done, therefore I obey The obedience, the good works, they're not in order to save us. They're a response because he's already saved us. And so our passage today ends with us doing these works. It's literally walking in them. Paul's using a brilliant image here in this whole passage that in the beginning we walk in disobedience and in verse 10 we walk in the good works that God has already prepared for us. And we're able, by his grace, now to do things that please him. And I want us to notice something that strikes me about this passage. Every single pronoun is plural. Now it's obvious when he says we and us, right? Those are plural. But in the English, we kind of lose it on the you. You know what I'm going to say. It's really y'all. Because it's plural every time. And I think once we understand that, it turns the diamond a little bit. It doesn't change what the passage is saying. It changes how I and we understand it. We make this whole passage so personal. And it is personal. We are, each of us who are followers of Jesus, we have personally been under the wrath of God and Jesus died for each of us individually and we have received individually his salvation as a free gift of grace. And so each one of us, each individual is God's handiwork, his work of art. But let's lift our eyes a little bit. Paul's saying something more than that because it's not just that I am God's handiwork, saved by grace. We all are God's handiwork, saved by his grace. It's together that we're his poema, his handiwork, his workmanship. And I'm a little bit afraid that we've so personalized this in 21st century American Christianity 
that we miss what it tells us about each other. I think Paul's saying, Ephesian church, y'all are saved by grace. Y'all are God's creation. Y'all have something to do that God planned for you before any of you even got here. And as I studied this, I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying to us, Fellowship Fayetteville, it's by grace y'all have been saved through faith, not by works. And now y'all are God's handiwork. Fellowship Fayetteville, y'all have good works to do that God prepared in advance before any of us ever got here. See, when we were all in different places doing different things and all dead in our sins, God didn't see a pile of lumber. He didn't see disparate ingredients in the pantry. He didn't see an undeveloped lot that was irredeemable. No, he saw our potential. He saw our potential and he provided the solution in Christ. He looked at us and saw what we could be. And now by his mercy and grace, he's created us, his body, the church, to go out and live out our faith in light of that truth together. And so that's our response. Our response begins with accepting the free gift that God's offering us. So if you're here and you've never placed your faith in Christ, if you've never said to him, I want the free gift of grace, I can't do this on my own, I need you, Jesus. I wanna invite you to do that even this very morning. It's just a matter of believing in your heart and, and praying to him that you want to accept him as your savior and follow him as your king. And for those of us who have been made alive with Christ, raised with him and are seated with him, we wanna remember that we're in this together. That this is about what God's not done, not just in me, but in us. And Jesus gave us a way to be reminded of that. We call it communion. I wanna invite our ushers right now to move to the back and to begin to prepare the communion elements for all of us. When we take communion, we take the bread, which represents Jesus' body, the juice, which represents his blood, and we take it inside of ourselves to remember that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. But we also do it together to remind ourselves that we all together are part of his body, the church. That it was by his sacrifice that he saved not just me, but us. And we're reminded when we take communion, it's all about Jesus. So I'll tell you what, if you're here and you're just checking out church, you wouldn't say that you're a follower of Jesus. When these communion elements come in a minute, just pass them on by. But if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, I wanna invite you, take that bread and that juice, it's double cupped, you just need one cup, the, the bread is on the bottom. Hold on to that. Reflect on his sacrifice. Reflect on what we're all a part of together. That because of his sacrifice, we're all part of something much bigger than just ourselves. And in just a moment, we're gonna celebrate that by taking the communion elements together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Thank you that when we couldn't get to you or even attempt to get to you, you came to us through your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray now, help us come to you repentant, appreciative, remembering. And, Lord, I pray that as we take communion, you would prompt us in our hearts to remember that you made a sacrifice so that we could all be part of this together.